France, September 1944. U.S. General George Patton's 4th Armored Division seems unstoppable as it rolls towards Germany. We were an avalanche of fire, fire and movement. But Hitler strikes back with hundreds of dreaded Panther tanks. The Panther was a real big thing. Made you feel pretty secure riding on one. <laughs> the American Sherman tanks use tactics to avoid destruction by the superior German armor. It's not a matter of just uh, firing. You, you, we had to think. At stake is the Allied invasion of Germany and the end of the war in Europe. Two giant armored forces collide in one of the biggest tank-on-tank -tank clashes of the war. This is the Battle of Aracor. after the D-Day invasion. Allied forces finally break through fierce German resistance and begin to roll across occupied France. The drive towards Nazi Germany has begun. British and Canadian forces advance in the north while the Americans strike south and east. Spearheading the attack is General George Patton's Third Army. Patton, considered one of the greatest field commanders in U.S. history, leads a powerful force of more than 160,000 men. 1,500 artillery guns and 930 Sherman M4 tanks. The M4 is armed with a short-barreled 75-millimeter gun with an effective range of just 800 meters and is protected by only 51 millimeters of frontal armor. It's vulnerable, but light and fast, able to reach speeds of up to 40 kilometers an hour. That speed makes the M4 the most maneuverable tank on the battlefield, ideal for Patton's rapid thrust across France. Leading the advance are the tanks of the battle-hardened 4th Armored Division. We had mission-type orders, and the best classic example of a mission-type order was Patton saying to us, go east and go like hell. So starting about the 16th of August, we went like hell. We would be moving 20 to 25 miles an hour down the road. We would recon by fire with the bow gun shooting one direction and the coax machine gun shooting another. So we were an avalanche of fire. When we hit resistance, if we uh, felt it was going to take us time, we just pulled back and bypassed. And at that time, the tanker's uh, byword was bypass and haul ass. The American advance is fast, powerful, and relentless. Vastly outnumbered and suffering huge losses, the Germans are forced into full retreat. The big advantage was material. The Sherman M4, you could destroy 100 of them, there were 120 more. <laughs> they never ran out of men either. Patton's forces overwhelm the Germans, who keep fighting desperately as they retreat. German units had by then already fought some battles with the Americans. We drove past those and onto the road. The road looked like an abattoir. Entire German platoons had been killed by airstrikes. We drove around the bend, and all of a sudden, we stood in front of an American tank, which was ready to shoot. 
And as soon as I moved the barrel, he started to fire at us. It was our luck that the gunner was nervous and fired at the slanted panel on our bow. The shell just bounced off and did no damage. Protected by 80 millimeters of frontal armor, the Panther is almost invincible to head on fire, and its 75 millimeter cannon has a higher velocity than the Sherman's, making it deadly even at long range. And he only got one chance to shoot at us. He didn't get a second chance. Our shells went right through their armor like it was butter. The American Panzer American tank crews used to say, we and the Sherman are only suicide candidates against the Panther. Sind gegenüber einem Panther nur Selbstmordkandidaten. But even the best tank of a Second World War is not enough to hold off the large number of Shermans in Patton's strike force. And in front of us on the field, there were anti-tank guns and tanks. The big battle started, and we got hit a few times. Their soldiers must have been nervous or inexperienced, because they kept hitting us on the front plate, and none of the hits had any effect on us. We brought down three tanks there. There were probably more, but during all that chaos, it was hard to tell. So then I continued on for a bit. And just before I got to the corner of these two roads, I saw a Sherman. But it was going so fast that it went straight across the road and ended up with its front end in the ditch on the other side. We wanted to shoot, and then one of the worst things that a tanker can experience happened. My electric firing malfunctioned. You just want to hang yourself or drown yourself when that happens. And then we realize he's going to fire at us as soon as he gets out of that ditch. And just as I turned my head, four more Shermans drove onto the road, and we couldn't defend ourselves. Langonki is forced to retreat. While all across France, German soldiers are doing the same. It was a, a pursuit, and, and we were moving faster than they could retreat. By summer's end, the relentless American air attacks combined with Patton's massive armored assault, brings the Third Army within striking distance of the German border. My tanks advanced from the middle of August to the first day of September when we crossed the Meuse River. My tanks had advanced 328 miles in 12 days. So we were euphoric. But that euphoria is short-lived. On September 1st, the 4th Armored Division is suddenly stopped in its tracks. On the 2nd of September, no orders. So we sat 2nd, sat the 3rd. We didn't know what happened. But on the third day, we learned that the reason we were uh, stopped was gasoline. The speed of the American advance has come at a cost. After five weeks of fighting, the Third Army has outrun its own supply lines and is forced to halt just west of the Moselle River. All they can do now is sit and wait for fuel. And we knew that each day that we didn't move, that was giving time to the enemy. That's the most valuable commodity on the battlefield, time. And the Germans were masters at reorganizing. So we, we thought we had a window of about five days. If we sat for five days, we were going to start hitting resistance because they could gather their forces. The 
the Germans take full advantage of the lull and gear up for a massive counterattack that will turn into one of the biggest tank-on-tank -tank battles of the Second World War. The Lorraine, a quaint and rustic region of eastern France near the German border. Armies have fought here for centuries, but nothing comes close to the ferocity of the fighting that took place here in the late summer of 1944. When this became a killing ground in one of the largest tank-on-tank -tank battles of the Second World War. September 1st. General George Patton's American Third Army has pushed the Germans nearly 1,000 kilometers across France and now approaches the Moselle River, the last natural barrier before Germany. But just as they get within striking distance of the fatherland, a fuel shortage stalls the American advance. And the 4th Armored Division, Patton's lethal spearhead, is forced to sit idle. And we knew that each day that we didn't move, that was giving time to the enemy. That's the most valuable commodity on the battlefield, time. The German army is in desperate shape. Since the Allied invasion in June, Germany has lost 400,000 men and now has just 200 serviceable panzers. Soldiers in the field struggle to keep up morale. Soldier never knows what's going on, except what's going around immediately around him. We still had faith. We still knew that we were going to win the war. We were told, you know, there's just something coming down the pipe that'll uh, frighten them so bad that they'll swim back to, to New York. Hitler has been gambling on the development of new wonder weapons to turn the tide of war in Europe. But their development has been slow, unsuccessful, and unable to match the speed of the Americans' advance. Hitler has one last chance at stopping the American juggernaut. Throughout 1944, German factories have been producing tanks in record numbers for the Eastern Front. Hoping to buy more time, Hitler diverts these freshly minted tanks to the west and creates new formations called Panzer Brigades. They're equipped with 135 Panzer IVs, 280 Panthers, and are supported by more than 14,000 infantry called Panzer Grenadiers. Among them is 18-year-old Heinz Altmann. The idea was to have fast-moving small units available as kind of fire brigades. They were intended to be used in the east. They were used in the west because that was all available at the time to stop the allied advance to the Rhine. Hitler's plan is to encircle and destroy Patton's stalled Third Army and then quickly advance northwest to drive a wedge into the Allied front line. In advance of the main attack, the 112th Panzer Brigade is ordered to head off the Americans, just west of the Moselle River, near the French village of Dompere. The assignment was to attack uh, Patton's Third Army in the flank from the south. We rode on tanks, as Panzer Grenadiers, we rode on a tank. Path was a real big thing. Made you feel pretty secure riding on one. <laughs> we advanced until evening came and stopped for the night. We dug in in, in the hills on either side of the valley and the tanks stayed on the bottom in orchards. And what happened was in the morning, the French uh, notified the coming allies. 
Here were these almost 50 tanks. The French 2nd Armored called in an airstrike. We didn't have any anti-aircraft protection in the, in the brigade. These aircraft came and attacked the tanks. It was a terrible sight. Uh, that we saw from our foxholes. The thing that stays in my mind was a tank being engulfed in napalm. And the crew comes out, uh, they drop to the ground and roll around. Terrible sight to see a human being burned to death. And by late afternoon, we had lost most of our tanks. So by the next morning, uh, we had something like eight tanks left out of the almost 50 and retreated with the tanks. The Panzer brigades had, didn't have their own artillery. They did not have their own reconnaissance units. The danger is they don't know where the enemy is. And the enemy knows where you are. It's like fighting with your eyes covered. The main attack has not even begun, and the 112th Panzer Brigade has already lost nearly 80% of its armor. It's a blow to German plans, and worse is to come. By September 13th, the now refueled 4th Armored Division crosses the Moselle River and resumes its advance towards Germany. In response, Hitler changes his plan of attack and rushes to meet the advancing Americans. He wanted us pushed back over the Moselle. He wanted to set up the Moselle as his winter uh, defensive line. So uh, he threw everything that he could gather at us at that particular time. September 19th, 1944. Heavy fog rolls in across the Lorraine, grounding American warplanes. At dawn, the Germans attack. The advancing tanks encounter small pockets of American resistance. gunfire alerts a platoon of American M-18 tank destroyers. They move forward, expecting to encounter a small force, only to find themselves face to face with more than 40 German tanks, including dozens of deadly new Panthers. September 19th, 1944. In a desperate bid to stop the American Third Army's advance towards Germany, Hitler launches a massive counteroffensive aimed at forcing the Americans back across the Moselle River. In the early hours of the attack, the 113th Panzer Brigade surprises and overwhelms scattered pockets of American resistance. The Battle of Aragorn has begun. A platoon of four M-18 Hellcat tank destroyers moved through heavy morning fog towards the sound of gunfire. The Hellcats reach the battlefield and come up against 40 tanks of the advancing 113th Panzer Brigade. With the destroyers, or TDs, is Private Paul Colangelo. After we realized they were German, we started to open fire. We would shoot and move. With our speed and maneuverability, we were having a field day. Each combat command usually had one uh, company of TDs. They could uh, penetrate the front slope plate of a panther. So they, they, they were lethal. Armed with a high velocity 76 millimeter cannon, the Hellcat is designed to quickly engage and destroy enemy armor. 
It has a top speed of close to 100 kilometers per hour, but that speed comes at a cost. The Hellcat's armor is only 13 millimeters thick, making it highly vulnerable to enemy fire. The Germans quickly exploit that weakness and knock out three of the four Hellcats. But Colangelo and his platoon have bought enough time for four more Hellcats to arrive. Leading the reinforcements is Captain Tom Evans of the 704th Tank Destroyer Battalion. As the fog burned off, we saw at least 30 to 40 German tanks start up towards us in a frontal attack. We waited and waited, then we fired. The leading two tanks were hit and stopped dead in a flame. The others, their crews apparently confused, turned sideways. That's where they made a big mistake. From our position, with only turrets showing, we hit 11 more as fast as we could load and shoot. It was a turkey shoot. By mid-afternoon, eight Hellcats of the 704th Tank Destroyer Battalion have knocked out 19 Panzers. The German attack ends in failure. It's the same story almost everywhere along the front. American forces holding back large numbers of advancing German tanks. But just outside the village of Aracor, the Panthers punch through American lines, threatening the headquarters of the 4th Armored Division's Combat Command A. Tank commander Jimmy Leach and his company get an urgent call for help. The Germans had a couple of brigades of tanks attacking CCA. Leach's company arrives just in time. They find the American headquarters caught off guard, defended by only a few artillery guns. The artillery was shooting direct fire at them and had them stymied at least. They had not spotted CCA headquarters. Their vehicles could be seen, I reckon, from the German position. But the Germans were concentrating on the artillery shooting. And Clark said, where's your company? I sent for you, you know, ages ago. They said, I want you to get rid of those damn tanks right there. You see them? Get rid of them. Yes, sir. Drive them away. I said, all right, I want us to deploy just beyond this point here, right here now. Deploy right out here in line formation and move toward these Germans, guns a-blazing. Well, when we emerged, guns a-blazing, the Germans turned tail and left the battlefield. And man, they took off. Went several thousand meters to the right and got up on a high hill. We should probably Go look for those bastards. Why don't we, before dark, move in that direction? Leach quickly rallies his men, and with his small Sherman force, launches a pursuit of the Panthers. A company went around the left on a high ground and then dropped down. And here was a German logger of over a dozen Panther tanks. A Company immediately started shooting at them, and they returned fire to A Company. We lost three Shermans. A Company lost its commander and two platoon leaders. Their armor protection was superior to ours. Their hitability, superior to ours. But we had the smoke round in the 75, The advantage of the smoke round was to screen the target where he couldn't shoot back at you, blind it, and then try to maneuver to the flank and get a flank shot into it. A Company's frontal attack is costly for the Americans, but it allows Leach's tanks to strike from the side, targeting the Panther's thinner, more vulnerable side armor. I gave by the left flank. Let's go. When I dropped over, we were right in the middle of them. 
I hit him broadside. Oh, I'm giving a fire command. Gunner, traverse right, steady. And when I get on a tank, I said, fire. We would be firing shot ammunition at these tanks. Shot is a solid round, anti-tank round. The M61 is an armor-piercing round designed to punch a hole through heavy armor. Traveling at 620 meters per second, an M61 round can easily penetrate the Panther's 50 millimeters of side armor. If I'd have hit him on the front like A Company did, it would have been bouncing off. But I hit him on the flank, and my guns would go right through the side of a German tank. Together, A Company and my company knocked out nine Panthers. By the end of the first day, the battlefield is littered with the hulks of 43 German Panzers. The Americans lose just five Shermans and three Hellcats. General Patton analyzed what was going on and they thought this was just a skirmish that the Germans had thrown at us, and it wasn't the real thing. It was a pretty good skirmish. It lasted uh, a day and a half of heavy fighting, tank versus tank. And he ordered a continuation of the attack to the northeast toward the Saar. The bulk of Patton's forces resume their advance towards Germany. Jimmy Leach and his company get orders to stay behind near the French town of Moncourt. I was to be the rear guard as they pushed on away from me. And suddenly, to my right, the Germans reappeared in spades in tanks again. September 20th, 1944. General George Patton's 4th Armored Division has been fighting off a massive German offensive aimed at driving the Americans back across the Moselle River and stopping their advance towards Germany. The Germans throw hundreds of new Panzer IV and Panther tanks into the battle. But the Americans, with their fast and agile Shermans, inflict heavy losses. Believing the offensive has petered out, Patton orders the advance towards Germany to continue. The 37th Tank Battalion rolls out and heads east, leaving behind the Shermans of B Company, commanded by Captain Jimmy Leach. I was to be the rear guard as they pushed on away from me. And suddenly, to my right, the Germans reappeared in spades in tanks again. Their tanks of the 111th Panzer Brigade, responding to Patton's move east with a surprise attack on the American rear, just outside the village of Moncourt. So I commenced a long-range firing, shooting at the Germans, and stalled them off a little bit. I ordered my exec and I both to dismount and go look over this hill. While I'm dismounted out in front of my own tank, up toward Moncourt on our right, a tank fired at my tank and missed it. I didn't have time to mount, so I motioned my tank to back up. There was a building nearby. When they fired a second round, and they missed again. Why, I don't know, but Boggs, my driver, stopped. That was all the Germans needed. Now they got a steady target. And the third round went right through the right side of the tank, knocked the head off of my driver, Boggs, and cut uh, Popovich, my uh, bow gunner, in half. But at this point, Abrams engaged that tank that knocked me out. 
Well, he missed that damn tank, but he cut a furrow near it, and the tank backed off and left. Abrams was well respected by every man in our division. I admired him for his uh, strength and leadership abilities. The bold and aggressive tactics of Lieutenant Colonel Creighton Abrams will earn him a reputation as one of America's greatest tank commanders. While leading the 37th Tank Battalion, Abrams will become the number one American tank ace of the Second World War. He didn't lead the attack. He didn't do that. But he was among the group of tanks that were in the attack. He was one of them. He could have been knocked out just like any one of us. By nightfall on September 20th, the Americans have repelled the German attack. But the Germans have taken Moncourt and pose a threat to the American flank. Abrams gathers his forces and with daylight fading, plans a bold and risky move. He'll strike Moncourt when the Germans least expect it, in the dead of night. It goes against all the rules of tank warfare, but it works. Caught by surprise, the Germans are all but wiped out. With the bulk of the German forces destroyed, the Americans consolidate their front and begin mopping up. We were retreating uh, in the face of uh, American advancing and got into Morsel, small village to the south of Slaudeville. Then late in the morning or early in the afternoon, uh, they uh, began to shoot uh, fog into our field of fire. That, of course, meant that there was an attack taking place. And we started firing into the fog. There were two or three tanks that advanced on the road. One of the guys who had dug in uh, let go with a Panzerfaust uh, anti-tank grenade. I don't know how he could have missed. He was right next to the tank, but he missed. The tank made a left turn, buried him by pivoting the tank around the, the tank track, around the hole, and that was that. Then orders came through to retreat. And uh, I did. I went down the embankment to the big farmhouse. Everybody had left. I was the only one that seems to have been left behind. I went around the corner of the building, looked down the main street, and here was an M4 tank. Oh, I'd say 50 feet away from me. That scared the hell out of me. It was bigger than an elephant, very menacing. And it seems that his gun was pointed at me. I just got scared. It was so big, I got scared. If I'd had a Panzerfaust, I could have picked that guy up like nothing. But I didn't have, all I had was a machine gun. I started running with the machine gun around my neck. That tank scared me. I still suffer from that scare. <laughs> By the end of the fourth day of fighting, the Americans have destroyed two entire panzer brigades. The Germans are on the run, but they're far from finished. Repeatedly beaten back by the tanks of the 37th Battalion at Aracor, the Germans turn their sights northward. They target the town of Chateau Salin, now occupied by the 8th Tank Battalion of the 4th Armored Division. We've been holding uh, high ground, dominating ground, holding terrain. We were stabilized. This is an unusual situation for us. 
we were an offensive weapon. We were good on the offense. Now we were in the defense. They were probing, they were shooting artillery at us. But somehow we sensed that they were building up to something bigger. And sure enough, at first light, we looked out, and there was this big patch of woods, Chateau Celine, and out of the woods started coming tanks. We started firing everything we had at them. We fired the medium tanks, they had the tank destroyers, a massive fire as they came out, so they knew immediately they were going to have a fight. The Lorraine Valley, a small pastoral province along the French-German border, known for its quiet fields and forests. But it was here for 10 days in September of 1944 that the Battle of Aracor took place. We are here on the site of the Battle of Aracour. We can see the landscape as it looked at the time. There are not many traces of the battle left here. Here's an example of the objects that you can still find, but they're very rare. Here's a 75 millimeter shell that we found between two tree trunks. It's been here for more than 60 years. And it's still there. No one has been able to remove it. It's one of the few traces left of the battle that once took place here. Germans of the 8th Tank Battalion of the American 4th Armored Division are defending the town of Chateau Salin. It was on the morning of the 24th of September. Uh, it was another foggy day, gray, miserable, raining, ceiling zero. I had everything that we could get our hands on. I had my medium tanks. We had a platoon of tank destroyers with us. We had all this lined up along the ridge, feeling that we were going to be attacked. And sure enough, at first light, we looked out, and there was this big patch of woods, Chateau Celine, and out of the woods started coming tanks. And these were mostly panthers, but they were interspersed were tiger tanks. The Tiger is one of Germany's biggest and most fearsome tanks. Its 100 millimeters of frontal armor make it virtually impregnable at long range, and its 88 millimeter cannon can destroy a Sherman tank at a distance of more than two kilometers. It has the best gun that was created in World War II, the 88, which makes it a fearful gun. So when, when it's head on, uh, if it's a... Uh, Tank versus tank, it has a tremendous advantage. And they had another big advantage. The sky was so uh, gray that there was no air. We couldn't call on air support. So they had that advantage. The minute they came into range, uh, even before they came into real uh, knockout range, we started firing everything we had at them. Massive fire as they came out, so they knew immediately they were going to have a fight. So what we uh, our tanks would do, they'd rise, go up to the hill, just high enough so that the gun was above the, the ridge, fire two or three rounds, move back, and then move to the side. 
Sure enough, uh, as, as soon as he moved, bang, bang, would come around in the area where he had just left. And they'd hit the top of the ridge and ricochet off. The, the most terrifying sound I've ever heard is an 88 hitting the ridge and ricocheting. Deafening, deafening, frightening sound. They kept advancing, little by little, and we kept firing. Every now and then, we'd see a flash, and we knew we'd hit them. And we were losing tanks. So uh, this got to be saw, sort of a seesaw. It was only a question of whether they would prevail. At that point, it was almost a tie. And then we noticed suddenly a, a little crack in the sky, a little daylight. And the next thing we knew, down came the uh, tactical air force. They apparently had been flying overhead, waiting for an opening. And the minute they saw this little opening, down they came. They started hammering away. Uh, they were sh strafing and bombing. Boy, we, we can't give them enough credit for the way they uh, operated in support of us. And at that point, uh, the Germans said, no, this is too much. And uh, the, the ones that were uh, uh, still uh, able to function uh, moved back. The Battle of Aracor continues for five more days. But Hitler's beleaguered armored brigades cannot break the stubborn American defenders. By the end of September, the Germans retreat back towards the Rhine. General Patton's 4th Armored Division has won the Battle of Aracor. On September 29th, the Battle of Aracourt ends with the victory of the American tanks over the last German tanks near richicourt la petite Nine Panthers were left burning in a field near the woods outside of Richicourt. We acquired this tank, which is a Sherman, of the same type which fought here, to maintain the memory of those who fought here and to show our gratitude for the freedom we still enjoy. In less than two weeks of fighting, the Germans lose 200 tanks and assault guns, almost 75% of their original force. And thousands of men are killed, wounded, or captured. It went badly for several reasons. One of them was completely uh, inexperienced top leadership. The whole planning at the time was so makeshift. There was such poor coordination operationally on the top level. We didn't have any training. We didn't even know each other. That was one of the major, major disadvantages of these new Panzer Brigades. The German soldier couldn't be blind to the reality of the situation that they were on the losing end. They were just losing too much ground overall on both fronts, you see, just moving, moving, moving back toward Germany. But the American victory in the Lorraine comes at a price. 225 men are killed and 648 wounded. 
41 Sherman tanks and seven Hellcat tank destroyers are lost. The 4th Armored Division seals its reputation as America's elite armored force. And for the rest of the war, they are known as Patton's Vanguard. It gave us notoriety uh, in the Corps and in 3rd Army. It was a significant victory because we uh, became extremely well versed and trained uh, in anti-tank warfare and tank versus tank warfare. We did a, a beautiful job of keeping the pressure on them. That was the big, biggest tank battle of uh, World War II. Uh, I can't think of another one. Sitting here now, uh, I find, looking back, unbelievable. But I'm very, very proud that I've been there. If I'd be asked to do it again, I would do it. I, I can't believe I was there. I can't believe I did what I did. It's, it's a very strange feeling.